Hi, I'm James Jenkins, and this is What's Your Story Vancouver? And that guy, that's Richard Glenn Lett. Hey! Basically, how did you, um, how and why did you get inspired to get into uh, stand-up? Stand-up, oh well, um, you know, I guess I, Lenny Bruce was uh, kind of a, uh, I read a book called Ladies and Gentlemen, Lenny Bruce when I was uh, way back in high school and I found it kind of cool that there was a guy that just could, you know, go on stage and say what he felt and get laughs and, and you know, what, sort of what an important uh, figure he was in the world and uh, I suppose I fell into it, um, yeah. you know, but I, I, once I did, I really enjoyed the the opportunity to just, you know, have complete control over what mm -hmm. the show was. He fell into it, but he fell in love with it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's true, yeah. yeah. That's how it happens. Uh, what do you grab your inspiration from for your material? Mostly my life. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, uh, I've got a lot of things going on. I've uh, battled a few uh, life-threatening uh, things, cancer mm -hmm. and addiction. Um, I have a daughter, you know, I'm kind of a political guy. I'm involved with all sorts of uh, things, whether it be, you know, the, the slam poetry and, and the kind of uh, activism that that, that sort of uh, draws from. And um, just, you know, caring. You know, I, I'm kind of like interested in what's, mm -hmm. what's going on. I always felt uh, like championing, you know, the underdog. And um, so, stand up and um, you know that that whole idea that you can rage against the machine was something that really turned me on nice I'm glad you mentioned addiction how did you um, how did you overcome addiction and, and when well I'm into my ninth year of recovery from alcoholism and drug addiction mm -hmm. uh, my main drug of choice besides tobacco which I've also stopped uh, consuming uh, was alcohol and that led to, you know, various other things. You know, and the, and the world of stand-up um, lends itself to that sort of thing. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, there's lo you know, there's addiction in every field. Mm -hmm. So you know, it doesn't really apply. Um, I did end up hitting bottom, and you know, going through a really rough patch where I was, you know, living in my car and completely psychotic, running away from a gang that didn't exist. And, mm -hmm. and those are the scariest gangs of all because they're everywhere. And, you know, so I ended up uh, having to go to rehab and into treatment out in, uh, in Abbotsford, a place called King Haven. And uh, since then, I maintain my sobriety by, you know, actively involved in one of the 12-step fellowships that, mm -hmm. that's going on all the time. How has it uh, affected your, your routine or your stand-up or your, your daily life? Well, you know, like the show that I'm doing now uh, is the opportunity to to help and to give back. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, stand-up itself was it was a form of addiction for me, mm -hmm. and the expectation, like, where's my, you know, HBO special? Where's you know, why am I, mm -hmm. you know, the sense of entitlement and the deserving that I that I should, you know, get, you know, things because I'm funny, mm -hmm. um, and that was. Um, I was treacherous and took me to a very dark place. Mm -hmm. So um, now I view uh, my work as a sort of uh, an out, uh, a growth from from my recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't constantly talk about recovery, but I do um, see what I do as an opportunity to help people, mm -hmm. whether it be you know even from you know playing clubs and saying some kind of edgy stuff. I still uh, see that as an opportunity to to reach out to people and, and have them see that you know that you can do what you want to do and you don't have to be loaded to do it. You exactly. know, so that's I would say how it affects mostly. Mm -hmm. uh, the industry, film, stand up, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, music, it all goes hand in hand with partying and with addiction and sure does. and all that stuff. So. Um, and right now, there's a campaign just started. It's called um, Call Time Mental Health. Right. Uh, and all the different unions are involved. Yeah, and, I saw uh, that. Yeah, yeah. I got an email about that. Um, do you have any advice for someone um, that's going through a hard time? Uh, 
How should I word that? Um, yeah. Do you have any advice for like any performer that needs that needs help? Or is, I know a lot of performers they incorporate that into their act. Sure. But how do you kind of separate yourself? You know, I view addiction as a as a disease, mm -hmm. and and so people think you're being a jerk, right? Like you know, if someone has you know cancer or diabetes, you wouldn't go like stop having cancer or you know. You know, get your pancreas in order. Mm -hmm. But because of uh, addiction, you know, the symptoms of it showing you, like, whatever, no, not showing up or crashing your car or just being an, an in, you know, not dependable person, mm -hmm. um, we think it's ethical, you know, like that, that we're bad people. We're not bad people, we're sick people. Mm -hmm. And the key is to be able to ask for help and to take that help. Exactly. That's the big difference, you know. Lots of people can say you're like, "Help me," and then you go, "Okay," and they go, "No, I don't want that." Or you know, like, "Help me, but help me this way." Yeah, exactly. Right? So, yeah. like I said, you can't do it on your own. There's mm -hmm. very little evidence to support that people can recover from addiction on their own. Mm -hmm. And so, reach out to people that you know have the same disease as you, and then you know, listen to what they say and do it. Exactly. You just got to yeah. talk about it. Yeah, and, uh, absolutely. Uh, getting back to your craft, how did you? What steps did you take to you know get to where you are and, and master your your routine and your craft? Um, and any advice for anyone else that wants to become sure. a sure? Um, people often ask me, you know, like how do we get into it? And I mm -hmm. mentor people. My uh, the, the warm up act for my show uh, coming up is uh, a comedian that I've been sort of uh, mentoring. And a mm -hmm. um, couple of things that I talk about are. Uh, when writing comedy, there's there's stakes and there's status. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at a joke, right? It has it's about you know ha having high stakes or low stakes or high status or low status. So you can take any situation and view it from that way. And that you know we don't like things we love them. We mm -hmm. don't dislike things we hate them. Mm -hmm. And from those large sort of leaps, we can can find. Comedy, and the other thing is, um, you're either looking up at something or down at something. Okay. So you're either being oppressed by something, or you're looking down at something and going, you know, that's crap there. And so you can sort of mix and match. The other thing I uh, advise people to do is, in your imagination, watch yourself walk on the stage mm -hmm. and start being funny, and then write down what that person does. So imagine yourself, you know, being a good comedian, and then mm -hmm. uh, trying to emulate that but you know pen paper you know coffee shops exactly hours hang, talking with other comedians i was going to ask you that is it do you network and do you like kind of workshop it and that kind of oh, stuff yeah. Or, yeah sure when i get together yeah. with katrina the comedian that i'm working with for the show we just bat things back and forth and go oh, yeah that's good i like that but what is that you know unpack that a bit or yeah i don't think that one that's pretty you know well-trodden territory. We're always sort of challenging each other to, mm -hmm. to reach sort of different kind of perspectives on things. There's a lot of common topics that people deal with, and we want to try and, as much as possible, uh, find something that's a little bit more unique than, than what everybody's talking about. You know? Exactly. Um, how often are you on stage? Oh, a couple times a week mm -hmm. minimum. I, you know, I play the piano, I write original music, I do slam poetry, I do stand-up comedy, do storytelling, so, and, you know, be, so somewhere along the line I'm on the stage doing something somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, my main job is as a stand-up comedian, so I will <laughs> tour and, you know, I'm going up to my high school reunion in, in Alberta in, uh, in the first week of June, and so I just set up gigs on my way out there and back, so you know, just mm -hmm. get a hold of people and, and do that, so it's kind of an opportunity there. So that's really key for someone coming up in the industry is to just be on stage as, as much as possible and, sure, and as much, fail. <laughs> sure, I mean, <laughs> failure is, is, you know, like you don't learn anything on a good day. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, it's important. I was reading a, um, an interview with an actor friend of mine, and he said um, that, you know, while you're you know, auditioning for things, go out and have a life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, comedians that are constantly existing within the confines of comedy club have a limited perspective on things. So, 
so do things like how can you comment on a, on a life if you don't have one mm -hmm. so as importantly you know be an active participant in the world and then bring that to the stage mm -hmm. uh, like I said stand-up can be an addiction unto itself and there are certain people that just can't seem to not take a night off there's something a little bit you know scary about that too comedians that just can't stop yeah. you know you're going like I knew yeah. Robin Williams, and he was that type. He had a lot of trouble just... Always on, basically. Yes, he was yeah. either heart of gold nice or over the top funny. Mm -hmm. And he just felt like going like, dude, you know, it's okay. <laughs> You're Robin Williams, you, you yeah. can afford to be shitty if you want. Yeah. You know, we have to allow people, especially, you know, people that are in the limelight all the time to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to be shitty sometimes, you know, and, and allow that. I think that was probably one of... The difficulties that Robin had was mm -hmm. not being able to be seen as anything except, you know, a great guy. Exactly, and obviously he had his his problems, but he, no one really knew about them because he never really. He was always on. He was always funny. He was always sure. happy. It's interesting but, with with someone like Robin or, or other celebrities. You know, when you're making movies, they have you know very expensive insurance policies. Mm -hmm. So you would have to lie. So you could say, well, so you're. Sober, you go, oh yes, ha 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 ha, and you just like, you know, go off and stuff. But, you know, I mean, he struggled with addiction to all sorts of things mm -hmm. his whole life and, yeah. and was never really clear of any of that. Mm -hmm. And, um, but you would see him interviewed and stuff, and they'd say, so you've been sober for 20 years. And he'd go, that's right, I have, ha ha, right? And he would go off, but you knew that the night before you saw him, he had tequila in his coffee cup. Mm. And nobody ever said anything, and that's that's the scariest part is when you're lying. When you're mm -hmm. when you're lying, you're completely alone, mm -hmm. right? And that's what you know these fellowships and you know all the getting together with people is about is the willingness to be honest about what you're really feeling, and then you don't feel so so alone, mm -hmm. you know? Because if I'm <coughs> lying, then who can I talk to? You mentioned uh, Lenny Bruce earlier. Yes. Um, has, did you look up to any other artists uh, and any, did you have any mentors? Uh, uh, yes, I would say, you know, the famous ones, you mm -hmm. know, starting out, like, because I'm old, mm -hmm. so George Carlin and Richard Pryor were the, sort of the yin and yang of stand-up comedy um, growing up. One of them, George Carlin, was, you know, <coughs> extremely literate and, mm -hmm. and wrote and was a very thoughtful uh, social analyst. Richard Pryor, the other, was extremely talented as a, a performer. He was a great actor, and he just like, and so you know, his voices and faces and personifications were, you know, second to none. You can see kind of a streamline of comedians that that go either from George or Richard, mm -hmm. and not necessarily uh, on our you know black white literally racial stream, although mm -hmm. certainly. <laughs> Eddie Murphy and Chris Rock, um, you know, you can sort Dave of Chappelle see them, stuff, yeah. uh, you know, the legacy coming from Richard, and then, uh, you know, George, you know, Dennis Leary, and, you know, Bill Burr, you know, mm -hmm. Louis, all these, you know, that sort of thing. And then, of course, we're all, you know, Taking br from and bringing our own voice to things as well, right? Yeah. Like, I play the piano, so the opportunity to you know, bring that into a show as well, or, or my spoken word. Sometimes people go like, you, like, you go, wow, you did a poem during your show? That's kind of different. And you go, well, have you heard of George Carlin? Because George did poems all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, you see Richard Pryor, and you go to these, these, you know, these monologues, these creative, dramatic monologues, these characters, Hambone, and all this stuff that he did that was, you know, full-on dramatic, you know, fourth wall up kind of mm -hmm. characterizations. So um, there's plenty of, you know, sort of precedence for that sort of stuff within stand-up from mm -hmm. the greatest of them all, right? Exactly. Where can uh, people find you, like, on any given night? Uh, well, I'm, I do a lot of uh, music and poetry at, on Commercial Drive at the Café du Soleil. Okay, yeah. This is my home club, uh, you know, Yuck Yuck's here on uh, 12th and Canby. I'll be doing my... Uh, latest solo show, which deals with the fact that I uh, had t testicular cancer 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I have a show called One Nut Only. 
and right. uh, that uh, and that deals that allows me to use all the different uh, uh, styles of expression that I have. I toured for a long time, um, you know, sixty or so shows of of a show about recovery called Sober but Never Clean, mm -hmm. and that talked about what we've been talking about as far as being a you know an artist uh, and trying to be sober and creative at the same time, and so. And then I just got the opportunity to talk about something else, and uh, men's health beca became something that's <coughs> very interested in. I mean, the reality is is that you know men die uh, prematurely, mm -hmm. and uh, a great deal of that has uh, to do with the fact that we just don't go to the doctors. You know, we'd, ra stubborn. we'd rather die yeah. than take on some of these things, and there's all sorts of reasons to for that. Whether that be uh, a personal like the embarrassment with not you know being you know strong or society telling us to suck it up or or people just not listening you know mm -hmm. my story with cancer is that I went into a walk-in clinic and told the guy that there was something off about my testicles he said is it painful I said not really he said oh well, I wouldn't worry about it and like I you know. Yeah. I, I know you wouldn't worry about it, it's not your dress code. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> but um, so then, I, but so then I had to go back, and every single yeah. story that I heard, every cancer story I had, begins with a misdiagnosis. Yes, hundred percent. So if you think that there's something not right, and you're some doctor's blowing you off, go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. you're, you're literally your life depends on it. Same you know. thing happened to my uncle when he kept going. The doctor had back pain and kept going to the doctor and they couldn't find anything and said nothing's wrong with you. And then finally, well, he's gone now. But, yeah, yeah, sure. Because exactly, they, right. they didn't go. They, you know, mm -hmm. and and we don't have a. We're not schooled in in telling where it hurts or why it hurts or mm -hmm. how it hurts. You know, I mean, the three leading causes of death in men are heart attacks, strokes, and suicide, mm -hmm. and all of those uh, come from. You know, like my daughter's into holistic medicine. She's a you know a licensed holistic nutritionist, and and I had high blood pressure, and uh, she said, "Well, Dad, that's a heart thing. That's that's about how you feel about yourself and the world." You know, there's you know a lot of what we look at in health that goes sort of unexpressed, which is you know, are we worth saving? Is our life of any value? Cancer literally grabbed me by the balls and said, you have a life worth living, live it or I will take it from you. Exactly. And so the opportunity to... Uh, <laughs> <it's not. laughs> Is that a fire alarm? All right, well, where were we before? <laughs> Welcome back to the, from the mayhem. The fire alarm just went off. Uh, Richard, you were saying, uh, you were saying something about... I was about saying that um, it's interesting because, you know, disease like cancer, all that can actually sort of wake you up. Mm -hmm. And uh, my daughter who's into holistic nutrition and, and therefore has a perspective on, on health, I had a high blood pressure, right? And I've recently lost like 30 pounds and going to the gym and dieting and stuff to deal with that. But she said to me, look, the high blood pressure, it's a heart thing. It's about how you view yourself and, and the world and, you know, whether or not you actually value your, your life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think there's a lot of uh, things in our world as men that say, you know, your life is worth something besides how much money you can make or, you know, your status or your fame. So that, you know, a lot of times, you know, when we struggle with, success and we don't reach it uh, then you know we just stop taking care of ourselves mm -hmm. and that you know tends us on a kind of a downward spiral and so this you know this thing with uh, the, the call me you know access and all this kind of stuff it's you know it's key because you know I mean it's not a zero-sum game in that you know women and children and animals and the environment and all those things are important too but my specific focus is on uh, telling guys, you know, like, like people are counting on you just to be there, not to mm -hmm. pay for everything or fix everything, but just to, you know, like my daughter doesn't care, you know, if I'm on Just for Laughs or get a TV part or a movie part or anything like that. She mm -hmm. just, you know, 
wants to be around to have sushi with. And, exactly. And we forget about that part of our lives, the, the human part, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's what the, my latest show is about, is, is reaching out to guys and going, you know, like, you know, you, we are, you know, worth, you know, taking care of. Exactly. It's funny how people start really living when they know when death comes knocking. Mm -hmm. and that's when they really start reaching out to their family and friends and, you know, expressing love and really looking after themselves and living, you know, life to the fullest pretty much every day. Well, and, that's the only way, yeah. place life is. I mean, mm -hmm. that's a big part of recovery. This idea of, you know, one day at a time isn't just about, um, you know, clinging to sobriety for 24 hours, but being present mm -hmm. because that's all there is. Mm -hmm. You know, right now, we just learned that when the smoke, <laughs> a fire alarm went off. Exactly. And like, wow, we're definitely in the moment now. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever we thought was going to happen has now changed, right? Yeah. It's the problem with the present is you can't control it. Mm -hmm. The thing about the past and the future is you can control it. You can win that argument you lost. You can accept your Academy Award in the future. The problem with the past and the future is that it doesn't exist. Exactly. You know, so... So you got to bend with life and with the present. It's going to be right here, right <laughs> yeah. now. If you're not, you're literally robbing yourself of your life. And that's what poor health and addiction and obsession and depression and all those things too. That's how they rob you of your life is you can't just appreciate what is going on. Mm -hmm. You know, you know that you know it's it's like the world's like some you know uh, sort of entertainment party where you're always looking over the shoulder to see who else you can be talking to instead of just mm -hmm. you know you don't know that the person you're talking to might be exactly right for what you need to be talking about. Exactly. You know so. 100%. Well, Richard, it's been a pleasure. Yes. I really appreciate it. And oh, yeah. I'm looking Thank forward you. to see you on the stage here soon. Well, thanks everybody for watching. I really appreciate your support. Uh, if you got anything from this interview or any of our interviews, uh, please um, like and share and maybe even subscribe. Uh, there's a little bell down there. Click that and uh, you'll get notifications every time we post a video. And uh, all of his links will be in the description below. And thanks for watching. What's your story, Vancouver? Our cities, our stories.